Hello, human geographers. We are back at it again this evening. Tonight, we are going to look at the consequences of the distribution of our population. Let's start with perhaps the most serious consequence, and that is overpopulation. This is when the number of people in an area exceeds the capacity of the environment to support life at a decent standard of living. So if you have more people than resources to support them, things like food, drinkable water, breathable air, space, then that area would be considered overpopulated. A common misconception is to just look at the number of people, the arithmetic density, and assume an area is or is not overpopulated. That is a dangerous assumption. Overpopulation is based on the resources available, not just the number of people. So what is that capacity? The capacity referenced in our overpopulation definition is known as carrying capacity. This is the population level that can be supported given the quantity of food, habitat, water, and other life infrastructure present. But you might be wondering, what is that population level? What is the number of people we can have before our school, our city, our state, our country, our world is overpopulated? But that answer is tricky. Let's go back to our definition of overpopulation and ask, what is a decent standard of living? Some of the most densely populated areas, places like Japan and the United States and many parts of Europe, have some of the highest standards of living. So are those areas overpopulated? But sparsely settled areas in the Amazon rainforest or the Sahara Desert cannot support many people. So are they overpopulated? Physiological density can give us a good idea about the carrying capacity of an area because we have an opportunity to examine how many people need to be supported by the arable land that is there to support them. So an area's climate impacts carrying capacity. The productivity of the land and the available technology can have an impact as well. But it honestly depends on the way in which we live. If everyone in the world, all nearly 8 billion people, consumed resources, food, water, oil, at the same rate as Americans, or people in many developed countries, we have already well exceeded our global carrying capacity. But if the entire planet consumed resources like a rural farmer in Kenya or Bangladesh, we may be able to support many more people on our planet. People are the driving force behind many of the impacts in our world. We emit pollution, we consume resources, and alter the landscape. Areas with high population density, like cities, typically have poor air quality when compared to low-density rural areas. This is because cities consume more resources and create more pollution from additional vehicles, as well as factories and heating and cooling devices. This uses large amounts of energy, but also generates lots of waste as well. And more people will continue to cluster in cities. So cities around the world will continue to expand, which can lead to declines in arable land. Expanding urban space can also lead to declines in green space, like parks and forests, which can also lead to the loss of wildlife habitats. Notice the growth in Bangalore in India over the span of 30 years. The red is the growth of the city, while the declining green and blue are parts of the physical landscape. High density and high concentration areas 
can see greater devastation from natural disasters, such as floods, like this one caused by Hurricane Katrina in New Orleans, and earthquakes. But the level of development in an area can affect the severity of losses caused by a natural disaster. Notice the devastation of Haiti after a magnitude 7 earthquake and the relative lack of destruction in Chile after a stronger magnitude 8.8 .8 earthquake. Shifting gears, let's talk about political consequences. As we've discussed before and we'll discuss in greater detail later, the population density throughout the United States is used to determine representation in the United States House of Representatives. There are 435 members in the U.S. House of Representatives, and the seats are reapportioned or redivided amongst the 50 states after each census, which is done every 10 years. States with high population density, like California and Texas, have lots of representatives, while states with low density, like Wyoming and Alaska, have only one representative. But each district needs to be roughly equal in population. So when we change the scale and look within the state, we can see that some districts are very small, and those districts are usually high-density urban areas, like this one around Las Vegas and Henderson. While other districts are very large because they're lower density and the population is more dispersed. And as the population changes, so too does the representation. In the last few decades, states in the Northeast and Midwest particularly the northern Midwest, have lost representatives as the U.S. population has moved to the south and southwest, and those states have gained additional seats. Our final conversation tonight details the impact of population distribution and density on economics and development. As we've addressed, people are clustering in urban areas at greater and greater levels. This has been true in MDCs for a while, but it's increasing considerably in LDCs as well. Many people will do this for economic opportunities like jobs, but also for access to facilities like schools and hospitals. This is because there is uneven economic development between urban areas and rural areas. High density areas like cities often have greater access to adequate housing, jobs, and fresh water, in addition to essential services like schools, police and fire, hospitals, waste collection, and other public utilities. Governments and organizations that provide these essential services have found that providing it to a larger number of people in one place reduces the cost per person, even though the total cost might be significantly higher. Therefore, it's easier to provide these services to clustered populations than more dispersed ones. In fact, many rural areas of the United States are farther from hospitals, and the hospitals that are present are in danger of closing for financial reasons. Businesses need enough customers to remain open, which is why many businesses examine population density and population growth when deciding where to build new houses, open new stores and restaurants. Even factories are interested in finding areas with enough workers, as well as the infrastructure to support their manufacturing operations. They need roads, railroads, bridges, airports, and communication networks many of which are funded with government money. And governments know that it's more cost-effective to develop those projects in high-density areas. There are many consequences, both unique opportunities and challenges that are heavily influenced by population density. And we will continue to examine this in greater depth back in class. 
Have a good evening, everyone.